Good evening again. My name is Roger Milici, and I am the Vice President for Fordham's Development and University Relations Division, and it is my pleasure to serve as the Master of Ceremonies at this evening's solemn and celebratory event. To all here present, our generous benefactors, Solon and Mariana Patterson and their families, our distinguished honoree, Dr. George Demacopoulos and his family, Father McShane, Mrs. Meyendorf and the Meyendorf family, His Beatitude Metropolitan Tikhon, the primate of the Orthodox Church in America, trustees, honored guests, faculty, students, and friends, I extend a warm welcome on this beautiful New York City afternoon. It is now my pleasure to introduce His Eminence, Archbishop Dimitrios, primate of the Greek Orthodox Church in America, for the invocation. His Eminence. Thank you. Good evening to everyone. Father President and beloved friend and deans and professor students, it's a great honor to have been called to offer the invocation. Since the invocation is not a formality without content and essence, I would like to just say that the invocation is offered in declaring our dependence on God, on what we are doing. And I always think of a verse in the book of Psalms, if God does not build a house, the laborers work in vain. And if God is not protecting a city, his soldiers who guard the city guard in vain. So whatever we do, and especially in a noble enterprise like the one in the university and the specific event of tonight, we do that in the presence and the dependence on our God and Creator, and in this spirit, let us pray together. O God of grace and life, Creator of the universe, source of truth and wisdom, we give thanks to you for your abiding presence and your enduring love. You have blessed us with your image and bestowed upon us unique gifts of mind, body, and soul. In this university where the mind is engaged in noble and creative pursuits, where ultimate questions and intense dialogue are encouraged, and especially where many study and contemplate theology and its relationship to life and purpose, we offer our deepest gratitude to you, acknowledging our dependence on you. O oh God, may your blessings be upon this university, the Orthodox Christian Studies Center, and the faculty, staff, and students who are members of this community of learning, faith, and science. We give thanks to you for the generous benefactors, Mariana and Solon Patterson, who have made the Father John Megendorf and Patterson family chair of Orthodox Christian studies possible. Their gift is a reflection of their experience and hopes and of their love of you, eternal God. They have also honored the memory of your servant, the truly unforgettable and unique Father John Magendorf, 
whose intellectual and spiritual leadership will guide theologians, clergy, and the faithful for many generations to come. It is a blessing that the inaugural holder of the Father John Mayendorf and Patterson Family Chair of Orthodox Christian Studies is Professor George Demacopoulos. We give thanks to you for his life and work as he continues to instruct, equip, and challenge minds in understanding the theology and teachings of our faith. As we celebrate this installation of profession, Professor Demacopoulos, in your presence, we offer our prayers for your blessings upon him abundantly. For this time that we share and for the great work that will continue in this distinguished university, we offer to you Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, praise, honor, and glory, now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Archbishop Demetrius. Hello, everyone. Today is a very proud day in our university's history as we celebrate the work and achievements of Dr. George Demacopoulos as the J Father John Mayendorf and Patterson family chair of Orthodox Christian Studies. This chair was established by a most generous gift from Solon and Mariana Patterson. We are thrilled to have Solon and Mariana here with us this evening as we celebrate this remarkable occasion. They are joined by their family, including their son John and their daughter-in-law Nancy and their grandchildren, Jack and Luke. Their generosity and thoughtfulness in establishing this chair will serve to enhance scholarship that is focused on the relationship between Orthodox and Catholic traditions, a cause that is important to both of them. The establishment of this chair will most certainly foster a strengthened Christian unity. Tonight, we also welcome Father John Mayendorf's wife, Matushka Marie Mayendorf, and her family. Father Mayendorf was an internationally recognized Eastern Orthodox theologian. We are proud that Professor Dimakopoulos will continue his work under the names of Mayendorf and Patterson to deepen the bonds between Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic traditions. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Harrington, Associate Vice President and Dean, Faculty of Arts and Sciences. John. Good evening. Tonight we are thrilled to honor one of our very own, Georgi Demacopoulos, PhD. As the inaugural holder of the Father John Meyendorf and Patterson Family Chair, George will honor the legacy of both. Father Meyendorf and the Pattersons by carrying forth the mission of Christian unity. Often praised by his colleagues as a gifted, thoughtful, and generous scholar, George Demacopoulos is a co-founding director of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University, and he is committed to advancing the center's teachings and promotion of Christian unity. His passion in this area makes him the most fitting inaugural holder of this chair. Professor Demacopoulos is a renowned scholar and author, having written numerous articles, essays, and books. We are thrilled to celebrate him and all of his accomplishments 
as he is inducted as the inaugural Father John Meyendorf and Patterson Family Chair of Orthodox Christian Studies. Thank you, Dr. Harrington. It is now my pleasure to introduce Fordham University's president, the Reverend Joseph M. McShane of the Society of Jesus. Much taller, Roger. <laughs> Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, my friends. As you have heard, tonight is a wonderful affair, a wonderful day, and a wonderful occasion for us, all of us here at Fordham. Uh, and at the outset, I want in a special way to acknowledge a number of people. They've already been acknowledged, but I feel in my heart I must acknowledge them once again. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge my dear friend, and I do mean that, Archbishop Demetrius, who has been for Fordham a great, great supporter, an inspiration, and a constant source of, of help for us in everything that we have done in order to bring the, Orthodox, the Center for Orthodox Christian Studies to the stage that it is at now. Your Eminence, it is always a grace to have you here, and tonight is no exception. Ladies and gentlemen, please acknowledge the great uh, man in the front of the I would also like to acknowledge his beatitude, Archbishop Tikhon, who is the primate of the Orthodox Church in America. Uh, we were speaking before, and it turns out that we shared time in northeastern Pennsylvania around the Scranton area, where, not surprisingly, uh, his beatitude enjoyed and continues to enjoy a, sp a splendid, splendid reputation as a man of balance, of holiness, and of very good humor, which is necessary in northeastern Pennsylvania, I think you would agree. <laughs> in order to deal with coal and gray skies. So your beatitude, welcome to Fordham, make this the first of many, many visits to our campus and to our community. And next also in the front row, Mrs. Meyendorf. As you know, your husband was for Fordham, not only a great teacher, but a man who really was a role model for many scholars who were educated here under his tutelage. Therefore, this night we are blessed, we are honored, we are graced that you are with us because we know that in welcoming you, we also acknowledge your husband and all that he did for us and also for St. Vladimir's. So Mrs. Meyendorf, please rise so that you might be acknowledged. Mrs. Meyendorf, although two of my brothers studied Russian, I have none at all. But I think there is a Greek word that describes your husband, and I think the archbishop and the primate would agree with me. Your husband was, in the eyes of all who knew him, axios. and to Solon and Mariana. You were among the first dreamers. You fell under the spell of the two extraordinary professors that we have who teach Orthodox theology here at Fordham. I refer, of course, to Telly, Aristotle, Papa Nicolaou, named for an obscure Greek saint somewhere in the ancient time, <laughs> and George Dimakopoulos. They came to me some years ago with a dream, with a vision, and they shared that vision with you first. And you opened your hearts to what they had to say, 
And not only did you open your hearts, but you supplied, you provided us with extraordinary support from the very first day that they came to you. Tonight, I want, on behalf of the whole university, to acknowledge the fact that you were the first dreamers with these two dreamers, that you were the ones, saintly as you are, who made their dreams come true, dreams that no one would have imagined could come true, that Fordham, the Jesuit University of New York, would become that place where Archbishop Demetrios told Pope John Paul II, the place in the world where dialogue continues on a serious level and where great affection between the Eastern and Western churches has grown. We owe this to you. Of course, I teased you at lunch, Solon, wise and a lawgiver. And Mariana, whose middle name is Elizabeth, you bring to us this night, not only yourself, but the three great and holy women spoken of in scripture. I think wisdom and holiness really describe the two of you and all that you have done. And so this night, again, I acknowledge you as the dreamers who became the doers, who made a vision a reality. So Mariana and Solon, could you rise to be acknowledged? Pope Francis said he wished he could be here, but the synod kept him away. <laughs> you think I'm joking. But I know that this is a cause that is close to his heart, the bringing together of our two churches, East and West. And so all the work that you have done, have, all the work that you have done has advanced his vision and the vision of the patriarch in Constantinople. I had to I had to correct George at lunch today. He said he was called to Istanbul. I said, where? <laughs> and he said, of course, Constantinople. I said, it's only a Roman who can call a Greek to truth about Constantinople. <laughs> and finally, by way of acknowledgement, I do want to acknowledge publicly this night the two dreamers, uh, Telly, who is over here, uh, and George. George and Telly came to me 12 years ago, and they shared with me this really, let's be honest, quixotic dream of making a Jesuit university the center for orthodox, serious orthodox scholarship, and the center also for Eastern and Western Christian dialogue. They never for a moment gave up on their dream, and they spun a web that brought many in. And it is understandable how and why they were able to do it, because theirs was and continues to be a compelling and holy vision. And so before we, we install George Dimacopoulos with proper fanfare, I want to ask George and Telly to stand to be acknowledged by everyone who all of us, I have to say, all of us are in your debt. Turn around. Is it oxioi? Uh, I think it oxii. I love both George and Telly, but they always correct my Erasmian pronunciation of Greek. But this is a family, and we can correct one another with great affection uh, and great regard. Uh, it, is, it really is something that I want to acknowledge. Last but not least, and I apologize that they are last, but we always save those who are most worthy for the last and greatest recognition, and that is George's family. George's family is with us this night, and uh, except for his sister, uh, who is in South Carolina and can't get out because of the floods. Please. 
assure her of our prayers and our support. But I wonder if I could ask George if you would have your whole family rise because they were the ones who made you who you are today. Now, I'm going to uh, do something that I shouldn't do. Liz Manigan, who is exceptional in all that she does, has laid out for me the formal script. I'm actually going to do a few things unusual. And uh, yeah, why not? Um, George, I'm going to ask you to come forward up to the platform. But I want you to be joined up here by a number of people. I want the Pattersons to join you. I want Mrs. Meyendorf to join you. And I want the two hierarchs in the front to join you because this is a really historic night. So George, could you come up here? And Stephen, could you come up for the, uh, the presentations? In recognition of your thoughtful and groundbreaking scholarship and service within your field, and on behalf of the human family, on behalf of the Christian Church, Fordham University is proud and delighted to welcome Dr. George Dimacopoulos to the Father John Meyendorf and Patterson Family Chair of Orthodox Christian Studies. George, we present you this night with this medal to acknowledge your position as a most accomplished researcher, educator, and mentor, and to signify forever your special place within the Fordham community. I am pleased now to introduce to all of you the Father John Meyendorf and Patterson Family Chair, Dr. George Dimacopoulos. I would now like to ask Dr. Friedman if he would present to George uh, the citation which is framed behind him. And now, if Dr. Friedman would be so kind as to join me in giving the frame citation to the Pattersons as well. George, 
May I now introduce you so that you may give your inaugural lecture as the Father John Meyendorf and Patterson Family Professor at Fordham University. Your Eminence, Archbishop Demetrius, Your Beatitude, Metropolitan Tikon, Father McShane, friends. Being named the inaugural holder of the Father John Meyendorf and Patterson Family Chair of Orthodox Christian Studies is a profoundly humbling honor. Humbling because I know that my scholarly achievements will never match those of Father Meyendorf. When I was hired, one of the first things a colleague of mine in theology told me was that although they had already recently hired another Orthodox theologian, the department realized that they were going to need a second if they were to keep the pace and achievement that Father Meyendorf had started in Orthodox studies. Matushka Meyendorf, I hope that you and your family know just how strongly Aristotle and I believe that we are indebted to Father John. He pioneered Orthodox Christian studies as its own intellectual enterprise, not just at Fordham, but throughout the American academic community. I am equally humbled to be the inaugural holder of this chair because it bears the name and vision of the Patterson family. I first met Mariana and Solon in Constantinople <laughs> in 2004. Since that encounter more than a decade ago, I have learned more about genuine Christian love and stewardship from the Pattersons than I have from any other source. As anyone who knows them will tell you, their great passion is the cause of Christian unity. It is what they have committed their life to supporting. I speak for all of us, Father McShane, Dr. Friedman, the Center's Advisory Council, and the Fordham faculty and students when I say that we are truly humbled by your faith, your vision, and your investment in Orthodox Christian studies at Fordham. Thank you. For those of you who have never been to, inaugura to an inaugural lecture of an endowed chair, it is a unique public event in the life of the university. There's the ceremonial component, we've done that. There's a list of people the chairholder must thank, I'm about to do that. And then there is an academic presentation that, where the professor conveys some aspect of his uh, current research to a broader community. In my case, I'm gonna offer an example of how advanced research in Orthodox Christian studies can not only revitalize some aspect of the Orthodox Christian tradition, but can also be an instrument in the cause of Christian unity. It is impossible for me to thank everyone who rightly deserves public recognition. Please understand that each of the people I will acknowledge represents countless more who assisted them. Your Eminence, you have been among our strongest supporters from the very beginning. But on a more personal level, I have always drawn inspiration from the fact that you taught at Harvard University. Like Father Meyendorf, your good friend, you have set an example for Orthodox scholars of my generation that we too, that we too should embrace the rigorous challenge that lies beyond the seminary. We have learned from you that if the Orthodox Christian tradition is going to survive and thrive in the modern world, then it can only do so by establishing a permanent presence in elite centers of higher education and by being challenged within that setting. Your beatitude. I speak for all of us at the Orthodox Christian Studies Center when I say how honored we are that you were able to join us this evening. 
since the time of Father Meyendorf. There have always been very close ties between St. Vladimir's and Orthodox studies at Fordham. That partnership is a key aspect of our work. We look forward to continuing that tradition and to serve as an academic bridge between all of the Orthodox jurisdictions in the United States. Father McShane, I know that I speak for Telly as well when I say that none of this would have been possible had you not been such an eager partner from the very beginning. You encouraged us to dream big, to think globally, and to make an impact. Fordham has the only university-based center of Orthodox Christian studies in the Western Hemisphere. And that is because you made it a university priority. We remain ever inspired by your genuine belief that the center's work is the mission of Fordham and that it reflects upon our common calling as Christians. For those of you who may not know her, Ms. Valerie Longwood is the major gifts officer for the Orthodox Christian Studies Center, and she is the person most responsible for transforming the idea of a center into a reality. For as long as this university exists, there will be a center of Orthodox Christian Studies because Valerie has done the actual work to secure its funding. Valerie, there will be hundreds of scholars and thousands of students who will benefit from your contribution. Aristotle and I look forward to continuing to work with you to make the center the most distinguished in the world. On this note, on behalf of Fordham and the center, let me thank all of you who are here. Those of you who have contributed to the financial support of the center. To date, you have invested $7 million in Orthodox Christian Studies at Fordham. To the members of our advisory council, many of whom are here this evening, I'm especially appreciative of your insight, your leadership, and your conviction. Transitioning from the supporters of the center to those more responsible for my personal intellectual formation, it goes without saying that I owe a greater debt than I can express to my dear friend, teacher, and colleague, Aristotle, Papa Nicolau. Peter Kaufman, my mentor at the University of North Carolina, also deserves special recognition. I'd like to thank Brenna Moore, Robert Davis, Brad Hensey, and Samir Haddad for the years of collective theorizing about religion. I keep trying to convince my wife that even though our reading group is so much fun, it should count as a work-related activity. <laughs> I've been largely unsuccessful with that line of reasoning. And while I cannot acknowledge all of my Fordham colleagues, I would like to offer special recognition for two members of the Department of Theology. The first is Father Joseph Leinhart of the Society of Jesus. In his own simple and understated way, Father Joe represents for me all that is special about Jesuit education. He is the quintessential scholar and a man of genuine faith. He has shown me nothing but kindness since I first came to Fordham. The second is Ben Dunning. I think that I've learned more from Ben than I have from anyone else in my professional career. Ben and Father Joe typify for me why Fordham is such an intellectually vibrant and collegial place to be, and why I am so grateful to be a part of the collective enterprise of higher education. I would also like to state my genuine debt to the many doctoral students with whom I have worked. Your questions, ideas, challenges, and enthusiasm continue to sharpen my scholarship and I simply cannot imagine having achieved this honor without your assistance. Of course, I must also acknowledge the guiding influence of my family. My father first came to the United States in 1959 as a foreign exchange student. As a child, he witnessed both the German occupation of his home and the devastating civil war in Greece, which followed World War II. Because of his exceptional academic promise, he was selected to be one of only five foreign exchange students 
from Greece that year to win the golden ticket of an American education. My mother, for her part, graduated first in her class in nursing school. Fifteen years later, she did it again with a master's degree, despite working full-time and raising a family. I have always drawn inspiration from the fact that she did this in an era when very few women had both an advanced education and a family. In many ways, the family member who offered me the most profound intellectual example was my maternal grandfather. As a teenager, I used to spend two weeks every summer fly fishing with him in Minnesota. He was a veterinarian by training and a voracious reader. What most impressed me about my grandfather was that he could disassociate a fierce intellectual debate from the love that he had for the person with whom he was speaking. It is a genuine grace to love those with whom you disagree. And my grandfather was the patron saint of this grace. Speaking of saints, I would also like to recognize the influence of my father-in-law, Father John Orfanakos. Although he was in many ways a very simple parish priest, he had an incredible theological insight born from nothing other than genuine love for other people. Finally, it would be impossible for me to stand here if it was not for the willful sacrifice of my immediate family. My children, Zoe and Lizzie, Eli and Grace, you have spent more time on this campus and in its library than most of our undergraduates. <laughs> they have endured my late nights and incessant out-of-town speaking engagements. My wife, who is more intelligent, hardworking, and accomplished than I will ever be, has been underwriting my academic pursuits for more than 20 years. In graduate school, I used to refer to this as the Kathy Fellowship, <laughs> when as a junior professor, I took a full year sabbatical at half pay the Kathy Fellowship became the Catherine Foundation. <laughs> my debt to her, of course, lies much deeper. She's my partner and conscience, and without her, I could have achieved none of this. Okay, now for the academic talk. War, violence, and the Feast of the Holy Cross in Byzantium. Please look for a moment at the image on the slide. It is striking, both literally and aesthetically. The image is a 12th century enamel that was placed upon a copper processional cross. It is often described as rep representing the submission of the Persian king Khosrau II to the Byzantine emperor Heraclius. While I am not an art historian by training, the image suggests to me that Heraclius is in fact executing Khosrau. Either way, it is historically misleading. Although Heraclius did defeat the Persian army at the Battle of Nineveh in the year 627, Crossroad did not surrender to him, he escaped. Rather, Crossroad was murdered the following year by his own son. And it was that murder, rather than the Battle of Nineveh, that brought an end to the bitter 26 year war between the Romans and Persians. While it is not surprising that the artist might dramatize Heraclius' defeat of the Persians in this way, it is extremely significant, I believe, that he chose a ceremonial cross as the vehicle for mythologizing Byzantium's former military glory. 
significant not only for what it suggests about the use of the cross as a symbol of military strength in the Middle Ages, but also because the emperor in question did more than any other to promote the empire's military interests through religious rites and images. My talk this evening will explore the ways in which the development of the liturgical feast known as the Exaltation of the Holy Cross was connected to Heraclius's broader effort to integrate Christian religious piety into a form of proto-nationalism that served imperial interests. It is my contention that the integration of religious nationalism begun by Heraclius so many centuries ago continues to distort Orthodox Christian sentiment, especially in traditional Orthodox lands such as Greece, Serbia, and Russia. Specifically, I will examine a group of hymns associated with the Feast of the Exaltation, which was fixed on the Byzantine calendar for the, uh, on September 14th, and which remains one of the major 12 feast days of the Orthodox Christian world. The Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross developed as, am as an amalgamation of three distinctive events in the life of the church. The first, of course, is Christ's victory over death through his crucifixion. The second is the legendary finding of the cross by St. Helen during the early part of the fourth century. And the third is the return of the cross from Persia to Jerusalem in the year 628. Let me be clear that while those three distinct elements became integrated into a single liturgical commemoration on September 14th during the seventh century, I believe that we should differentiate between the theological significance of Christ's saving act on the cross and the subsequent liturgical commemoration that began during the Byzantine Middle Ages. As we will see, the hymns for the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross that were developed, especially those during the seventh and eighth centuries, conspicuously reflect Byzantine imperial concerns and thus became more militant at precisely the same time that war with the Persians and Arabs most challenged Byzantine imperial power. As any Byzantine art historian will tell you, the appropriation of the cross as a physical symbol of Christian faith was very slow in its development. Truth be told, there is virtually no evidence that Christians employed the cross as a physical symbol of their faith prior to the fourth century. Its eventual popularity was almost certainly triggered by the Roman Emperor Constantine, who chose the figure of the cross as his military standard. In other words, the cross served as a military and imperial insignia before it became a popular symbol of Christian identity. During the early seventh century, the Byzantine army took Constantine's militarization of the cross significantly further by carrying what they thought was the, a piece of the actual relic of the cross into battle with them. It was during Heraclius' reign in the year 614 when this relic of the cross was actually captured by the Persian army. The relic remained in their possession for the duration of the war. Only after the murder of King Khosrau was the cross returned to the Christians as a token of good faith for the new peace between Persia and Byzantium. When Islamic armies began to threaten Byzantine lands for the first time just a few years later, Heraclius continued to employ the relic of the cross on the battlefield, but using the cross as a military talisman achieved little. By the end of Heraclius' reign, Islamic armies occupied every Byzantine city in Egypt, Palestine, and Syria. While Heraclius may have defeated the Persians, by the end of his life, nearly half of the Byzantine Empire had fallen to the Arabs. In terms of the liturgical commemoration of the cross, 
The oldest surviving attestation we possess is Egeria's account from, the year, from Jerusalem in the year 384, which testifies to both Good Friday and September the 14th as occasions for ritual devotion. The origins for the selection of September 14th as a feast for the cross lies in the fact that this was the date of the consecration of the fourth century basilica at Golgotha, where the relic of the true cross was initially housed. In other words, the development of the feast, uh, the, I'm sorry, um, the development of the feast on the cross, um, I'm sorry, okay, I'm <laughs> In other words, the development of the Feast of the Cross on September 14th was tied directly to the anniversary of a specific church in Jerusalem. For most of the Christian world, the commemoration of the cross occurred only on Good Friday. Indeed, beyond Jerusalem, we don't have any evidence for the Feast of the Exaltation until the year 614, when a liturgical possession took place for the first time in Constantinople. I do not believe that it is a coincidence that the Constantinopolitan commemoration of the feast began during the reign of the Emperor Heraclius and during that year specifically. 614 was the very year that Heraclius' army had lost the cross to the Persians in battle. The Emperor's appropriation and militarization of the Jerusalem feast were key components of a wide-ranging program to integrate public religious rituals with his ongoing military operations. We should not confuse the late development of the Feast of the Holy Cross or its bellicose connections with the ample evidence we have for theological reflection on the cross that had occurred for hundreds of years um, and was offered uh, and um, there were Greek, Latin, and Syriac authors who had been offering profound analyses of the soteriological significance of Christ's crucifixion. Commentators such as St. Cyril of Jerusalem and St. John Chrysostom repeatedly focused on the cross as a vehicle for cosmic victory that Christ had had over the power of death. And many authors after the age of Constantine recommended placing crosses in public spaces as a kind of spiritual shield against demonic activity. When we look specifically at the hymnography associated with the liturgical commemoration of the cross, what is so striking is that there is a dramatic distinction that exists between those hymns that predate the reign of Heraclius and those that originate during his reign or afterwards. While the dating of hymns is a notoriously difficult enterprise, I will offer a few examples where issues of dating are not terribly problematic. Let's begin with the Condacion dedicated to the cross by the famous hymnographer, St. Romanos the Melodist, a hymn that we can comfortably assign to Constantinople in the middle of the sixth century, about 60 years before Heraclius. Most scholars believe that this condacion was created explicitly for Good Friday. A condacion is a specific kind of hymn that offers a fictional dramatic dialogue between two or more characters who are off stage for an actual historical event, the same way that Greek drama worked. Set in 18 stanzas, Romanos' Contacion for the cross is a dialogue between two characters at the time of the crucifixion. The two characters are hell personified and Satan. The hymn opens with hell having been pierced in the stomach by the cross. In anguish, he announces to Satan that he wants to release Adam and Eve and all of their descendants. Satan, who cannot feel or see hell's affliction, criticizes hell's reluctance, 
and tries to convince him that the crucifixion of Jesus will be their victorious moment. At the midpoint of the Kondakion, the dialogue between hell and Satan abruptly ends because the events of Christ's crucifixion have unfolded. Satan now understands that the cross has vanquished the power of death. Stanzas 10 to 16 offer Satan's lament at the loss of his own power and at his foolishness for not seeing the multiple prophecies of a triumphant cross in the Hebrew Bible. The final stanza of the entire hymn, which would have been very long to have been sung, is the only one that speaks on behalf of the Christian community. It pledges that all Christians will nail themselves to the cross and to sing praise to the Lord because through the cross, humans have been granted eternal life. Drawing on themes found in both Ephraim the Syrian and St. John Chrysostom, Romanos' Condacion employs the language of violence, of pain, and suffering. The suffering of humanity, the suffering of Christ, and the suffering of hell personified. At times, Romanos employs military imagery to dramatize his story, as in the opening stanza when he describes the cross as a lance that pierces hell's stomach. Elsewhere, Romanos leans on Roman imperial structures when he speaks of the cross as the throne of Christ or of Christ himself as a tribune who advocates for the common citizen against Satan. But this military and imperial language is always in the service of the theological assertion that the historical act of Christ's crucifixion destroyed the power of death over humanity. There is no equivalence between divine power and imperial power, no equivalence between Satan and the enemies of empire. When we compare Romanos's Contagion to the hymns for the Feast of the Cross that developed during the reign of Heraclius and later, we find that the military concerns of the empire are granted a prominent role. And more critically, we find that many of these hymns ask God to inflict violence on imperial enemies through the cross. The most popular of all hymns for the Feast of the Exaltation in the Greek tradition is known as Soson Kyria, which was almost certainly composed on the occasion of the return of the cross to Jerusalem in the year 628, the centerpiece for the development of the current feast. Soson Kyria is now the Opolitikion, or dismissal hymn that serves as the primary hymn for the feast of September 14th and for all additional commemorations of the cross throughout the liturgical year. In English translation, the hymn reads, O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Grant victory to the emperor against the barbarians and guard your empire through your cross. The opening request, save your people and bless your inheritance, is a quotation from Psalm 28, verse 9, a psalm that in totality fits very nicely within a grammar of divine violence. Not only does the psalm anticipate that God will render vengeance upon evildoers, he will destroy them, but perhaps more significantly, the Lord of Psalm 29 is a Lord only for the believers. Only they are strengthened and only they are saved. But there is more to this short hymn than the opening reference to the psalm. The most striking requests are those that follow. First, to grant victory to the emperor against the barbarians. And second, to guard the empire through the cross. Note, the prayer does not ask for the protection of the emperor or that he might rule for many years, two very common aspects of ancient political acclamation. Rather, it asks that the emperor be a successful warrior. The second appeal to guard the empire is perhaps less explicit about the use of force, but it is no less significant in implication. 
Indeed, the internal logic of the prayer is that the Christian community secures military victory for the emperor and the protection of the empire through the proper veneration of the cross by the faithful. The cross preserves the people, it saves them also. But it does so through the emperor's application of violence. Lost, at least in this hymn, is any explicit affirmation that eternal salvation comes through Christ's willful sacrifice on the cross. Lost also is the notion that the victory of the cross is a victory over death. For this hymn, the violence of the cross is an act of violence, one that at least implicitly causes death. For those of you who don't know this slide, this is a very famous slide taken from Hagia Sophia. It's the um, Emperor Constantine um, holding the city and the Emperor Justinian holding the church, right? Two models of imperial benefaction. For more than 100 years, prominent European and American scholars have maintained that Christianity essentially lost its soul with the conversion of Constantine. Their argument is based largely upon a flawed, likely bigoted assessment of the role of the emperor in the Byzantine church, a role that they caricatured as Caesaropapism. Among his many important contributions, Father Meyendorf exposed the flaws in that interpretation, noting, among other things, that this reading of history assumes that Byzantine political theology was always Eusebian in nature. For those of you who are not familiar with Eusebius, he was a court historian and political propagandist for the Emperor Constantine. And he described the Constantinian moment as a transformational epoch in a divine script for human history. For Eusebius, there was no distinction between imperial politics and the work of God. No distinction between Constantine's wars and God's action in history. Father Meyendorf was able to demonstrate conclusively that Byzantine canon law and dogmatic teaching always rejected the Eusebian view. Even if there were moments in Byzantine history such as the reign of Heraclius, when individual emperors were able to maintain, I'm sorry, were able to manipulate the church's leadership. From my perspective, the problem with hymns like Soson Kidia is that it provides a kind of backdoor authoritative standing to this Eusebian political theology. It implies that the Christian community is ontologically dependent upon an imperial political structure, and it presents the empire's military conflicts as the unqualified defense of the only people who belong to God. In other words, once Heraclius was able to get Christians to sing hymns like Soson Kidia, the political ideology of the hymn was granted a kind of authoritative quality within Eastern Christian discourse, even though its content stands in contradistinction to scripture, the writing of many church fathers, and the hymns of previous generations like the Condacion of St. Romanos. Soson Kyria is just one of dozens of hymns that became associated with the feast of September 14th in the Byzantine Middle Ages. And to be sure, it is something of an outlier because of its strong emphasis on the cross as a vehicle for divinely sanctioned violence. As new hymns developed, especially of the new canon type, they returned again to the soteriological significance of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. But at the same time, one of the most significant features of the canon hymns for the exaltation of the cross is that the majority of them also include some aspect of the imperial and militant spirit of Sosonkiria. 
Through this combination, they offer a double play on the violence of the cross. The violence that Christ suffered on our behalf and the violence that the cross will inflict upon the enemies of the Christian empire. Given this historical setting for the composition of these hymns, this pairing should not surprise us. From the seventh century until the 15th, the Byzantine Empire was almost constantly at war with either Islamic, Slavic, or Crusader enemies. One of the most substantial and interesting hymnographical arrangements related to the Feast of the Holy Cross is the canon attributed to St. Cosmas the hymnographer. St. Cosmas was an eighth century bishop of Gaza and associate of St. John of Damascus. In his hymns, Cosmas repeatedly refers to the cross as an invincible weapon. And like Sosonkidia, Cosmas's canon frequently calls upon the cross to empower the emperor against enemies, adding the paradoxically doubling statement that the cross is both a weapon of peace and an unconquerable sign of victory. What is so intriguing about the comparison of the canon of St. Cosmas to the material that precedes him is that he was writing from a very different political space vis-a-vis -vis the empire. Cosmas was a bishop in Palestine a century after the Byzantines had been routed by Islamic armies. In other words, Cosmas was part of a Christian minority under Islam. He never set foot within a Byzantine empire. Like many patristic commentaries on the cross, Cosmas skillfully reads the cross into the actions of the Hebrew saints and his theological focus remains fixed on the death and resurrection of Jesus. But he also incorporates the political ideology of Eusebius by framing the Constantinian event as the culminating moment in the divine script for human history. And he reiterates Eusebius's contention that divine favor translates into imperial victory on the battlefield. Even though Cosmas' political reality lies in sharp contradistinction to the imperialized Christianity of his hymns, he nostalgically continues in the Heraclean tradition that sacralized the violent exploits of Christian emperors. It is likely for this reason that his hymns resonated with post-Heraclean Byzantine sentiment, and as a consequence, his arrangement was adopted in later Byzantium. Cosmas's hymns, like Sosonkidia, remain key elements of the modern Orthodox cycle of hymns for the feast of September 14th. To be sure, we can link the change in Orthodox hymns associated with the Feast of the Exaltation to a very specific historical context where Byzantine political and military concerns overrode previous hymnographical emphases on the theology of Christ's sacrifice. And while I firmly believe that every genre of theological reflection is contextual and therefore reflects the concerns of its era, I would like to propose that the militant turn in the hymns for this feast is especially problematic for the development of an orthodox political theology because music impacts memory and thought structure more substantially than other forms of cognitive input. While I do not have the time to explore it in detail here, new advances in cognitive science and musicology have demonstrated that music affects our brains more powerfully than other sensory stimuli. Many of us, I am sure, have had the experience of a tune popping into our head for no apparent reason and often lingering longer than we might like. Cognitive scientist and music engineer David Levitin calls the fragments of melodies that lodge in our brain and will not go away earworms. 
His research has shown that content lasting only 20 to 30 seconds has the most powerful effect. Short, bold, and catchy hymns like Sosonkiria perfectly fit this model. As Fordham doctoral student Lisa Holzberg writes, these earworms constantly press their existence into our consciousness, prodding us into actualizing their content in our lives. In other words, brief, provocative, and ideologically oriented hymns like Sosonkiria possess a deceptively powerful ability to shape our political epistemology. Through the combination of communal singing and cognitive recollection, Sosonkiria reflects and reinforces an errant political theology, which in a post-imperial setting prompts a dangerous nostalgia for a bygone era of idealized, even mythologized Christian empire. While the Byzantines may have dreamed of a society where church and state could work together in perfect harmony, every scholar of Byzantium will tell you that this integration never actually existed. The church suffered as much at the hands of Byzantine emperors as it suffered at any other point in history. And it is precisely because, I'm sorry, it is precisely because the distinction between the ideal and the real is lost on the political opportunists of the present that so many traditional Orthodox countries have problems with a kind of religious nationalism that is nostalgic rather than genuine and xenophobic rather than Christian. Left unchecked, this sentiment can fuel a radical populism of intolerance and ignorance. This is precisely what we see today with the rise of the Golden Dawn Party in Greece, a neo-fascist movement that masquerades its xenophobic ideology under the banner of Orthodox Christian solidarity. And while the Russian church's promotion of the Russian world concept is not as egregious, to be sure, as the evils of the Golden Dawn Party, it is similarly derivative of a Eusebian political vision that presumes a direct connection between political and religious culture. And it is precisely because hymns like Sosonkiria help to sustain an imperialized and militarized version of Orthodox Christianity that it is so difficult for us to forestall the errors of this kind of nationalist agenda. To my mind, the real danger is that the Eusebian model is ripe for exploitation by figures like Vladimir Putin, whose promotion of what he calls traditional orthodox values is always self-serving and only rarely reflects genuine Christian principles. It would, of course, be simplistic to suggest that Sosonkiria leads directly to Putinism. And I am, of course, aware that some Orthodox traditions have tweaked the language of the original Greek hymn. But I do not think that it is a stretch to suggest that the thousand-year tradition of singing hymns like Sosonkiria opens a discursive space within the orthodox imagination where manipulators of religious sentiment like Mr. Putin have room to lay claim to the Eusebian heresies which propose that the political leader of an orthodox population is the de facto protector of orthodox Christianity and that those outside the state are the natural enemies of the orthodox. What is especially deceptive and blatantly wrong about the Ruski Mir project as it is promoted by Mr. Putin is that its animating thesis is one in which Orthodox Christian values are framed in diametric opposition to Western Christianity.
Allow me to make a few closing observations on a more optimistic tone. <laughs> Concerning the ways in which advanced research in Orthodox Christian studies, like the project that I just introduced to you, can contribute to the cause of Christian unity. I believe that this is especially true for research devoted to questions of pandemic Christian concern, such as war and violence. For centuries, Orthodox Christians have embraced a narrative of victimization at the hands of Western Christians. Of course, anyone familiar with the events of the Fourth Crusade understands the complaint. Not only did the Crusades lead to the direct demise of Byzantium, but Christian minorities in Syria, Palestine, and Egypt suffered more at the hands of the Crusaders, much more, than they ever did from their Muslim overlords. So that while there is historical truth in the claim of victimhood, in recent generations, Orthodox anti-Western apologetics have emphasized over and again the notion that Orthodox Christianity is superior to its Catholic counterpart precisely because Eastern Christians never sunk to the level of the Crusades by sacralizing violence. And this argument has been employed by more than, you know, the vigilantes on, in the blogosphere. Some of the most prominent Orthodox thinkers of the 20th century adopted this narrative but the claim simply isn't true. Not only did the Byzantines sacralize violence through the singing of hymns like Soson Kyria, but they also developed a rich and troubling notion of holy war, and they completely abandoned the early Christian notion of the soldier turned martyr so as to erect the facade of the military saint who exerts violence in the defense of the faithful. What is so ironic about the Orthodox proclamation of innocence is that the Byzantine Emperor Heraclius is partially responsible for the Crusade movement. By the 13th century, Heraclius had been largely forgotten in the East, apart from being condemned for heresy, even if his valorization of violence continued to live on through the hymns associated with the Feast of the Exaltation. But in the West, Heraclius was very well known and celebrated as the first crusader, the first Christian soldier to take up the cross and fight the infidel. In other words, both the medieval West and the medieval East are guilty of betraying an earlier Christian tradition that understood war and the application of violence to be a tragic failing in every occurrence. The histories of both Orthodox and Catholic populations are filled with examples of militant behavior that betrays the message of the gospel. In short, both have sinned and both have a great deal to learn from the other and from studying a collective past. While it would be both anachronistic and naive to think that early Christians were pacifists in the modern sense, there were a series of early Christian authors, Greek, Latin, and Syriac, from the third through the seventh centuries, who offered nuanced reflections about how a Christian might pursue a life of non-violent restraint and repentance in a world filled with violence. Through a, careful examin through a careful examination of our common past, I believe that Orthodox and Roman Catholic Christians have the opportunity to allow the sins of the past to serve as a vehicle for collective correction. We have the opportunity to explore more carefully those authors like St. Ambrose of Milan and St. Basil of Caesarea, who so strenuously resisted the Eusebian political vision that authorized imperial violence on behalf of the Christian community. And to borrow a phrase from my dear friend Aristotle, through 
the intellectual resources provided by the field of Orthodox Christian studies, we all have the opportunity to pursue an asceticism of self-critique. Through self-critique, the Christian comes to understand more fully how to be genuinely human, and he or she finds the courage to transform the carnage of our world. If we have any hope in addressing the unprecedented challenges that lie before us, terrorism, school shootings, refugees, poverty, ecological destruction, the way forward can only be one of Christian unity. And on the Orthodox side of things, this can only begin if we have the courage of faith to shed the naive presumption that the Byzantine church never made mistakes. The Byzantines knew that different times called for different hymns. That's why they constantly produced new hymns to speak to their present. It is time that we do the same. Thank you. Thank you. In just a moment, the St. Vladimir's Choir is going to come up. Before that, I have to have a shout out to Liz Manigan and Jill Logan, who put together the best receptions in New York, um, and they do it constantly at Fordham. Um, so I want to thank them for their support, not only this evening, but for over a decade now. They're, they're just fantastic. And now we are going to have a little singing from the St. Vladimir's Choir.
Thank you very much, St. Vladimir Seminary Octet. And George, thank you for enriching us. I'd now like to invite His Beatitude Metropolitan Tikhon, Primate of the Orthodox Church in America, to come forward for the benediction. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we are Christians living in a world that too often still uses religion as a cover for violence. We thank thee for the witness of George Dimakopoulos and scholars like him who unwrap the difficult history of the past to shed light on our present challenges. Bless him in his work and life ahead. We thank thee for the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham, their staff, students, benefactors, and supporters, and especially Solon and Mariana Patterson and their family. Bless them and all who believe in actively working for better understanding and closer relationships between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. We thank thee for the teaching, writing, and witness of Father John Meyendorf, who devoted a lifetime to Christian scholarship in service to the church, to Orthodox unity in this country, and to building bridges with Catholics, Protestants, and the ecumenical movement. We thank thee for Fordham University and St. Vladimir Seminary, for whom Father John was a beloved teacher and a figure of unity. Bless Father John's wife, Matushka Marie. Bless his family, and may his memory be eternal. At the 9-11 memorial a few days ago, in his gathering with religious leaders, Pope Francis said, I trust that our presence together will be a powerful sign of our shared desire to be a force for reconciliation, peace, and justice in this community and throughout the world. For all our differences and disagreements, we can live in a world of peace. Lord, bless everyone gathered here and give us the courage to be witnesses and instruments of thy peace now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you very much for your beatitude. Ladies and gentlemen, before we end, please uh, acknowledge Solana Maria Patterson one more time. Thank you very much. Now, on behalf of our president, Father McShane, I'd invite you to the uh, reception just outside these doors. Thank you.